Hello, everyone, and welcome to day 21 of the Level Up Symposium. My name is Andrew Scraver, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to a sneak peek of Frequencies created by Heist, coming to you live from Halifax, Nova Scotia. This event is presented by the Associated Designers of Canada with support from Toaster Lab's Mixed Reality Performance Atelier. I am one of the co-curators of the symposium, as well as a member of the ADC, and I am super excited to be here hosting you for this event. Uh, so I would like to first acknowledge that I am coming to you from Chachage, uh, which is the settler city of Montreal, uh, which is known uh, by the current caretakers of land, the Ganyakahaga Nation, as Chachage because of the way uh, which means broken in two because of the way the river splits around the island. And now this place was and is, uh, has long been a place of conference, conflict and creativity for many indigenous peoples, including the Anishinaabe, the Huron-Wendat and Abenaki peoples. And so I am honored to be here to be able to share and create with you all. And so I offer my thanks. And so in this spirit of gratitude, I would like to first acknowledge the support of the Canada Council for the Arts, who is the primary supporter and funder of the symposium as a whole, as well as our other sponsors, IATSE, the University of British Columbia, Theatre Alberta, CITT Alberta Chapter, Concordia University, Ryerson University, York University, and all of our individual donors. Thank you so very much. I'd also like to give a shout out to our uh, board member volunteers and our other volunteers, uh, all of our presenters and our participants and attendees for making this symposium so special for all of us. So thank you all very much. So for your information, uh, all of our symposium events will be recorded and presented in a freely available archive on our website within a few days of the event. Uh, so thank you all for joining us here today uh, for this event. Uh, you're watching this live stream either on the Level Up website, which is levelup.designers.ca, or on HowlRound through our partners at Toaster Lab, or on the respective Facebook pages of the ADC or Toaster Lab. And regardless of your viewing platform, embedded on the same page as your video is a chat function in the right-hand corner of the video window. You can click on the little speech bubble. Uh, feel free to add any questions or comments that you have throughout the presentation. Uh, and uh, those will be read out to our guests after, after the little demo. Uh, this event can be enjoyed through auditory or visual access or a combination of both. Now, I will read aloud all questions that come from the chat. Uh, visual access is also supported with captioning for myself and for the rest of the speakers in the archived version of the event. So captioning will appear below directly below myself, as you can see here. And uh, if you require technical assistance to support your access, please email levelup at designers.ca for immediate support or to provide feedback uh, following the event. Uh, and if you enjoy this session, please consider donating anything that you can to the Associated Designers of Canada to help support our National Arts Service Organization in its goals of advocacy, mentorship, and industry promotion. Uh, donation links are available on all viewing platforms, on our website, on the ADC's website, which is designers.ca, or on uh, canadahelps.org. So please uh, consider donating anything that you can. So that's it for our announcements. Thank you very much for your patience with all that. Uh, so it's now my pleasure to introduce the creators of Frequencies. Uh, Heist, a live art company committed to creating, producing, and presenting innovative, genre-bending, and queerly playful performances in Halifax and beyond. Uh, an important element to their organization is having a clear and strong commitment to diversity within culture, abilities, and gender. Heist is comprised of artistic director Richie Wilcox, Managing Director, Sylvia Bell, and Technical Director and Performer, Aaron Collier. So uh, without further ado, uh, please sit back and enjoy Frequencies. Hello, everybody. Uh, <laughs> I um, This is just a little actual candid hello, not part of the show. Uh, I'm here, uh, as, I'm Aaron Collier. The performer in Frequencies, and I'm here with Sylvia Bell, who is wearing the VR headset. And if I had a mirror, maybe I could show you, but I think you might be able to see um, our feed as well from our uh, laptop on the side. And I just wanted to give you a little background. Uh, today, we're going to throw to a clip of Frequencies that we have recorded in the past, and I'm about to tell you why. Um, uh, we were getting ready for this, and then suddenly um, our synthesizers and our little uh, devices uh, 
just spontaneously broke, and it, it brought to mind this this quote um, that uh, I just thought I would read to you. It's from The Far Side, and it goes like this: The edge is a fickle hellcat. Well, around here, we walk the edge, and the edge is a fickle hellcat. Love her, but never trust her, for her heart is full of lie. <laughs> and we do love the edge. We do love the VR headset and the camera attached to it and these synthesizers and all the cables connecting it to the computers and graphics cards. But um, we do have a little, little trouble on the trusting side, but we do have no problem with the love. Um, so we are going to play you a, a clip of sort of where we are in our process and then uh, we will be with you live to uh, walk through some, maybe some of uh, the other looks we're creating and uh, open to any questions about how and, and why we're doing this. Um, but as you can see now uh, in Sylvia's gaze, the show is done in this way. It's direct address myself to you, um, to our, our scene partner, who is uh, somebody that you'd have to some, come see the show to figure out, I guess that you might figure out in this demo. And uh, we've placed some objects sort of around that we can uh, interact with as well as created some immersive environments. Um, and it's all made through Touch Designer, linked with Ableton Live, linked to a bunch of broken synthesizers and some other things. So um, without further ado, if the, the really incredible folks at uh, Level Up wouldn't mind throwing to our video, and then we would love to join you afterwards to discuss mortality. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's do it. You're here. I made a show for you. And it, it centers around some music that I made. I, I started looking around in nature looking for frequencies or relationships between things to manifest as music. I was trying to find a new perspective, a new way to see things. Like this. A clock. Marking seconds passing. I imagined that time was sped up so that each tick was marking one hour of time passing. So 60 minutes or 3,600 seconds passing every tick. And I imagined all the things that can happen in an hour happening that quickly. I imagined Earth making one full rotation every 24 ticks. And so to help feel the days pass, I added a massive accent every 24 ticks at midnight. Then I imagined the sun in the late morning beginning to rise and setting in the early evening. And then I imagined the moon crossing our sky every 24 hours and 50 minutes. So moving just at a phase with the sun. And then I sped it up. dance of the moon and the earth and the sun. Now we tend to group days into weeks, so I made a melody to count the weeks. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. The phrase repeats every week and I kept speeding it up. sound of days passing on Earth, I began to think about what would it be like to live a year like this. And so
So. January 1st, 1981, Prince Edward Island. Mom and dad are pregnant with their fourth child. And Chris, Chris is 15. He's in Army Cadets. And then Andy, his little brother, is going to be five this year. He's got mad artistic skill already. His friends are drawing stick figures and he's drawing three-dimensional people. Mom and dad are really hoping for a girl this time. And that's it's not quite gonna work out, but sort of. Listen, the days are getting a little bit longer. More sunlight every day. And then, as the seasons shift, I'm born. It's a complicated birth. Mom loses so much blood, she almost dies. But she's strong and she pulls through. And after a brief stay in the incubator as I was very tiny, Mom and I come home from the hospital as the days continue to get longer and longer, more sunlight. The air is getting warmer and warmer. You can hear it. And at last, summer arrives. Oh, the best season on PEI. Mom and Dad, Chris, Andy, and Aaron. The best season on PEI with bike rides and beach days, fresh strawberries, camping, catching fireflies and jars at night. And Mom and Dad, they have to work really hard to have that yellow bungalow where we live, but we don't want for anything. Days are already starting to get a little shorter. The evenings are starting to cool off just a touch. Autumn is approaching. It's mom and dad's favorite season. And then as the leaves begin to turn, I'm six months old and I'm able to roll myself on my back from my abdomen and I'm able to grab my feet. <laughs> And the world is so new. It's so real. Isn't it something being born? Isn't it something being nothing and then suddenly being something? Less and less light, cooler and cooler temperatures. And then it's winter and it's January 1st, 1982. Happy New Year. The tides, as all the water on Earth follows the pull of the moon. Visualizing a year this way, it made me think about how all the seasons and the time of year is just referencing where we are on this line, on this path. And I thought about how we're all born and we're all going to die somewhere on this path. Okay. <laughs> oh, this is so easy. Okay, are we back? We're back. Um, so um, we're just gonna try a little live demo here. Um, this is uh, uh, an excerpt from later in the piece. Here we go. So here's a new perspective. Ooh, the sound you're hearing right now is green. I made it by taking the frequencies of several shades of green and then dividing them by two 40 times. So green light 
40 octaves lower and transposed to vibrating air. It's a pretty high note for me to sing, but try and sing green 40 octaves lower with me. Nailed it. Try and sing green 41 octaves lower. 42. Uh, 43 octaves lower. Uh, <laughs> that felt good. Green light is mom's favorite color. Green light is just photons, tiny packets of energy vibrating really quickly. And to be green specifically, they have to be vibrating between 540 and 580 trillion times per second. No big deal. Deep red like the sphere in my dream. Those photons have to be vibrating 400 trillion times per second and it's close to the lowest frequency that we can see. <sighs> Making this music, I figured out that people can see about an octave of light but they can hear about 10 octaves of sound, which is, I guess, why I can sing the same note at several octaves, but I can't really uh, picture a color an octave above green. Go on tree vibe. Ultraviolet. Ultraviolet and green sound good together. The woods have always been a kind of refuge for me. Andy and I will spend our childhoods playing in the woods. And then when I'm a teenager, I'll start to come here alone. I wasn't really sure how to deal with the sadness I felt back then. Oof, and then there were the hormones. Junior high was rough. I kind of stopped hanging out with my best friend. I hate school. I don't know why it's so hard to concentrate and motivate myself. Andy's gonna be leaving the nest soon. and Mom and dad are starting to pull away from each other at this point. I have a girlfriend though. She's a pretty cool human, but I'm kind of faking the romance part, and mom and dad don't approve of this relationship. She's 18, and they probably assume I'm doing stupid shit, getting into trouble. Right, so what are you gonna do? But I love my friends. We're definitely like the weird kids. We have this band called Permabuzz, and we play at these local all ages rock shows. And the best thing in my life right now is being in a mosh pit, slamming my body with as much force as I can into a mass of sweaty boys 
while a band called System Shit plays music that can only be described as a lawnmower driving over a field of forks and knives. Go. I want to be a rock star. I want to be someone else. I want to be not scrawny and hairy and gay. I want to be closer to my parents, but further from myself. I want to be good at school. My grades are like plummeting at this point and Dad wants to open up and get close, and he stops me one day as I'm leaving the house. He's had a few drinks, and he's got tears in his eyes. And then he says to me, I don't know what's happening. You're our smartest child. We lost a child once. And then he hugged me and kissed me. Which was a really brave and vulnerable thing for him to do. But I couldn't see it. I couldn't see anything except my own fear and shame and angst. And that's the one time that he was able to mention your death to me. We lost a child once. I know. What's happening? I feel depressed. And I don't know why I feel depressed. I have no reason to feel depressed. I'm ashamed and I feel gross and horrified and disgusted by my body and by my thoughts and who I am. I want to be somebody else. Sometimes I hate myself. Sometimes I feel a grief that is so acute that I want to peel off my skin and merge with something bigger than myself. dream still haunts me. I'm beginning to wonder if it's somebody I know. I'm beginning to wonder if it's you. I can see now that then I had two choices. I could uh, slow down and go inward figure some things out, but I wanted to speed up and go upward. Not you on the stream. You don't have to go on the clock. It should, yay. Oh. It should be up near the top of the queue <laughs> list, and it, and it should. Yay. Oh. <laughs> there was some so cute we're back. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So we're back. Um, and I think things worked. Yeah, they did. Do you want to pull up some chairs for you here? Sure. I'll grab you this stool there. Sure. And we can pop in if we need to. Yeah. Um, I'm uncertain if I should leave my microphone on, but I think maybe maybe I'll pop my in ears out. It feels a little bit like removing necessary body parts. Oh, 
how do they get in there so deeply? <laughs> Hi, Andrew. Hello. That was <laughs> awesome. You. Yeah, you too. That's great. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for that. That looked awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Very um, excited to see uh, where where what the final product is. Where you go with it? <laughs> Soon we open next week. Um, yeah. In our process right now, we're three quarters probably through the show. What you saw in the video clip was a, a number of days ago of something near the beginning of the show, which um, which we wanted to show to you because it kind of sets up the the sort of beginning of the story and the story does take place over the the course of it's kind of like a oh uh um uh, over my 39 years of time mm -hmm. so um you know that's part of my adolescence there so but that's probably halfway through the show mm -hmm. maybe a little bit past halfway through the show where we were there mm -hmm. very nice uh well why don't uh now we've got team members here why don't you all just uh, take a second and uh introduce yourselves and Tell us what you're doing. Uh, Sylvia Bell, I'm the managing director with Heist and the VR operator for uh, for the show, for Frequencies. So okay. you wanna jump in here? Oh, uh, I'm Matt. Uh, I developed uh, a bunch of the touch designer modules, so a bunch of the visualizations for the show. Um, yeah. Cool. Hi, I'm Alex, <laughs> I'm a technical <laughs> assistant. <laughs> I'm Anne Marie. I'm directing. Great. And Welcome. Well, there's more. Oh, and I'm Maria, and I am assisting with uh, stage management. Great. Well, welcome everyone to the uh, to the show. <laughs> um, yeah, this is this is awesome. Why don't you uh, yeah, just tell tell us a little bit about your uh, your inspirations? Actually, before I say that, if anybody has any questions in the audience, please get them in now. We're gonna try and finish this up by uh, the hour because uh, they got to get back to work. Uh, so um, yeah, just uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your inspirations and where this, how, how the show has come to be. Okay. Well, it's been in development, like as we started in 2018, actually in Montreal, um, as a sort of proof of concept, the, the music came first, this idea of taking these kind of pseudo science experiments turned into techno music of, of um, maybe trying to change the perspective on time so that you could get a different sense of the relationship between things. Um, in that piece, you heard green. Uh, and at the beginning, you kind of get to feel the, the way the sun and the moon feel, you know, if you sped them up, watching them from Earth. Um, and there's a number of these kind of types of experiments that I was trying to do. And I thought, well, why not tell us, well, not why, why not? But I had this, a couple ideas. One was that, you know, singer songwriter shows, you get a chance to, to understand a bit about the songs and a bit about the artist. Um, but in techno shows, that doesn't really happen. You don't really go to the club and they, they bring you in and tell you all about their life and why they wrote the music and how it was made. So I had the idea that maybe I would try this kind of idea of a techno songwriter show. And so to illustrate one of the pieces, I just decided to tell the story of 1981. And uh, that sort of cracked open the, the story nut. And yeah, shortly thereafter, this, this team that you see now, uh, slowly one by one started to get assembled. And Marie's been with us the longest. And um, it was a live show, I performed it on, uh, I put a circle down on the ground and we pointed two projectors at it. And we had a ring of 20 people sitting around that circle. And so it was a really intimate sort of actual, you know, breathing the same air and particles show. Um, <laughs> and when, when the pandemic hit last year, we were actually sort of about to start experiments on how you scale that kind of a show. So it felt great for 20 people, but what if you wanted to do it for 200 people, you know, try to multiply everything by 10 and see if it still works. And so we were going to try those experiments and testing and figure out how to maintain some sense of intimacy and some relationship like that while having a bigger sense of scale and louder sound and more spectacle. 
And then the world said, no, you wanted an <laughs> intimate show. You're going to get one. So that's when we started to dream about the various ways to do it digitally and, and the, the sort of idea of having Sylvia in the VR set sort of personifying the, the, the person that the play has already been centered around um, is the, the route we chose to go with this. <laughs> that's kind of the, the origins of how this came to be. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, and so you are opening next week with an yep. audience in the space. Well, no, Wednesday we're going to open, but um, so here in Nova Scotia, we are quite blessed in terms of how the pandemic is feeling for us right now. And we are able to have audiences, but um, we had been planning to not have audiences from the get-go. We, we are going to try some experiments with some invited audience um, okay. because it's easier for us to control. We're here at the bus stop theater in Halifax, which is a wonderful small space, but it's also a very DIY space and our team is working to the max. So once uh, the factoring in the treating and, uh, you know, the audiences have to be cared for in a different way in COVID times, as we all know. So mm -hmm. we're going to try some experiments as, 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 as with people we know to get a sense of what it's like to be in the room and watch Sylvia and I interacting yeah. in a space with nothing uh, while you see it on the TV screens and see how it's all put together. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. That's really fascinating. I love watching the tiny screen version of you performing it live while also watching the VR version. I think that's really great. Could you um, see my ridiculous slow motion running at the same time as how cool it actually looks? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's really great. Um, yeah, so you have, there's there's obviously another camera in the back that's uh, pointed on you as well as Sylvia's or no? For the, for yeah. the running part, yeah? Yeah, so yeah. we have two cameras. Well, like the, there's a VR set, which is an Oculus Rift S. Um, and uh, attached to the front of it is a Z Mini, which is like mm -hmm. a stereo um, camera. Uh, and that those are Sylvia's eyes and your eyes for the most mm -hmm. part. And then we have a Kinect camera in the back that we end up to do that kind of sort of multi 2D composited scene thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, that actually leads into a really great question from our audience. Um, can you talk about the process of your performance development in relation to the VR world development? <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> we can. It's it's <laughs> like every day right now is is this uh, our process? I mean, you can you want to speak a little bit about our process and like how it's coming to be as a schedule and as a team? Yeah, it's been a, a completely different ball game than even we realize. It's software development. And I don't think that, you know, building a theater show, you don't typically tend towards that kind of a schedule. And we gave ourselves four weeks and we hired a whole, um, you know, virtual reality team to help build all of the modules and all of the, the, that software so that we got to rehearsal and were ready to use those things. Uh, and realistically, we should have had six months because <laughs> four weeks allows you to find out what you want and how to use it, but it doesn't necessarily allow you the process of properly documenting every step and making sure that every connection is connected in a way that you can go back and easily change it and tag it onto something else. And so um, that's just that, but also we're still a theater company or a live arts production company. You know, we struggle to get funding to do a three week rehearsal process, let alone a six month development pro process to hire a team. We've had five people that we've hired just to help support Aaron in the development of this program. And Aaron only started coding in January of last year. And mm -hmm. here we are in a, a massive software development program. Um, and so scheduling is completely different. You know, we don't just have rehearsal time. We've got a rehearsal schedule that has three full days of rehearsal a week and a couple of half days because, and a full day that's just development. So we've really had to manipulate what our, our schedule looks like to suit the fact that we're not, it's, it's not props and carpentry and lighting and all of those things, it's, it's software development. And, you know, we've started using a photography lighting because the cameras don't like theater lights. And so having to come up with different ways 
of maneuvering that has been a huge part of this process in in trying to get us to Wednesday of next week. So yeah, yeah. And then your process as a direct. Tour. This is like, don't look at us. Look at the screen. <laughs> All we want to do is look at them in the space, and it's not so interesting. <laughs> But, you know, when I do look at the screen with everything integrated and all of the virtual reality and worlds, immersive worlds. But I will tell you, there is something fascinating watching ostensibly two actors uh, connecting over a deeply personal and intimate story. Uh, we ran probably 55 minutes all connected for the first time the other day. And the first thing that happens is these two embrace for a really long time because Sylvia has been just clocking minute, intimate details of Aaron's every movement, every thought. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the blocking, although in the theater looks not so interesting, actually, I feel like Sylvia's managed to find a way to shoot this <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in a personal scene partner kind of way. Mm -hmm. Like that for me is the new way of thinking about directing. Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, putting, yeah, it's not, Sylvia's shooting it, but also, you know, for anybody out there who's been in VR, like, you know, <laughs> I'm completely in my own world. <laughs> like, they're regularly talking to me, and I'm like, I know you're in front of me because I can hear you and I can feel your energy. But I can't see any of you. Like I need to remind people sometimes. Yeah. Like, can I come back to the room? Yeah. Can I mm -hmm. be I'm in here? A floating two-dimensional forest, <laughs> flying, <laughs> literally. Yeah. yeah. So that actually that that does lead into a question that I was wondering about. How much do you ever? How much of Aaron do you see in your in your world? Even in the even in the the forest world, do you have? Can you see the objects that are around you? Or is it all just? Uh, so what you see what yeah. you see is what okay. i see so any movement that is there is because that came came through me and so there are worlds where we have different levels of the vr where we see aaron in full even though we are in that vr world like there's a transparency level that we can play with so that you can see more of him or more of the space that we're in we go into technicolor sometimes and it allows us to look at the whole room and you see everything but you're in this this crazy color. Um, and then there's other times where I'm pulling the cord and pretending to go around a door and there's no door, you know, like your brain does an interesting thing because, well, your brain knows what it means to go through a door, but that door is not real. And so just trying to wrap your brain around a movement that's been trained inside of you that's not there, you know, like clocking mm -hmm. that it's okay to take that step forward, even though it looks like you're going to drop, you're not going anywhere, you know, mm -hmm. having that trust in, in your ground and that people in the room are going to stop you when you want to run into whatever is <laughs> there that you want to run into. I mean, uh, that was an interesting thing that we didn't necessarily anticipate when we started this, because this, you know, we were like, let's do this. We don't know if it's possible. And then we started it. So so many things we learned in process. And one thing is that like with a VR set or at least our VR set, there's, there's drift in terms of its positional tracking. So when you center a scene and then you play for three scenes, you're not really centered anymore. Things have a drift to them in a strange way. And so we've, we've got spikes on the floor for Sylvia that they're like Braille. They're raised up, and if they feel a certain way, Sylvia knows which way that she's facing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that we can be like, as soon as you get there, we can fire a little centering cue for you mm -hmm. <laughs> so that the next scene is going to come up where you think it should and so that you can get angles on things. It's mm -hmm. a bit of a trip. Yeah, and the, the learning how to trust and not trust the system at the same time. We've done a number of runs where it's like, okay, well, we're gonna just have to go with this now. And it's completely opposite to what it is because we both know what objects are appearing in the room. We both know the story in a way that like, we're just gonna shift things around and move and engage because how, what do you do? We're in the middle of a scene and we've got to like start learning how to move forward in that trust of each other and telling the story and hope that next center spike, it comes back to us, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. That's really fascinating. It's a very different way of working than 
you'd be used to in normal theater, right? So are yeah. you, uh, Sylvia, are you normally, do you ever, do you, do you act normally? Is, or is this something also completely different? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm like the, I'm furthest thing. I don't even want to like play categories or like okay. one of those like, <laughs> like not Great. my thing. I'm a stage manager, production manager. I deal with the things that are happening behind. Mm -hmm. uh, and Aaron and I had big conversations around whether or not this was for us, but we are heist. We do try and keep our team small so we can tour and, and make those choices so that in COVID times, if we need to set this up in the living room, then, you know, we've already committed as a company to being in each other's bubbles. So we made those choices and um, I've been around the show for so long that it just felt like it was the right choice uh, to, to put me in it. But mm -hmm. um it's great. I questioned it at the beginning. Am I the right person? Because I don't have any acting. I've been in a number of rooms, but that's not that that wasn't what I would have considered my instinct to to be there. Um, but it's I think it's working out well. I think it's <laughs> <laughs> you, you always want a scene partner who awesome. listens deeply, and that's yeah. exactly what Sylvia's yeah. doing. But also mm -hmm. she gets into very committed actor positions, like <laughs> very physical work. You know, we had to have an Alexander coach movement coach come in to you know help okay. you, you know figure out how to I learned how to move my head I didn't know I was moving my head in properly but mm -hmm. some things of having that set with the like cable and though it's not it's maybe three pounds four pounds with just that little bit of a tilt from the cable um, but it does make a difference in how you're moving your body and and how far you can look up and and how to adjust in that way was Mm -hmm. you know, a big, it was actually a huge help to just <laughs> learn how to move my head properly made, a, made a huge difference. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, yeah. V VR systems already when you're, you're moving, there's already something that's strange, but now you have to position yourself with another person who's there uh, and make sure that you're catching your spikes on the ground. There's a lot of complication that's involved in this. And so, <laughs> so kudos. <laughs> I said you can't see. <laughs> <laughs> we, when you run things too, it's funny, right? Because like, like in a theater too, like when you reset, like it's it's just like okay, like if you're gonna reset for a big thing, you know, like you have a revolve, okay, we'll move the revolve back, and then we'll go to another lighting cue, and then we'll get set, and we'll reset all the props, and then we'll kind of go back, and then we'll start running. And whereas this is just like. Bam, you're in a whole other immersive world that's terrifying. Sorry, Sylvia, we should have given you a heads up. <laughs> uh, just the, 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 the nimbleness that you can, you can transform, even without moving, is it's awesome. But it's also lear learning how you build with it. Yeah. How do you go back and try something again? How do you tweak something? The mm -hmm. order you have to load things, too. <laughs> the order you have to load things, yeah. 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 I saw a question yeah. about what engine we're running this in. Is that the right yeah, word? Yeah, that, that was actually, that was coming from Emily backstage. <laughs> so what, yeah, what engines are your worlds running in? It's it's all touch designer. Mm -hmm. So it is, um, so Ableton is the, Ableton Live is the timeline. And uh, all the music is in Ableton Live, and then all the uh, most of the automation and cues are in that timeline uh, in Ableton. And uh, normally, uh, before it, it stops, before you do your first presentation in front of people, um, I have this little uh, ring, and it's got a button on it that sends MIDI. Hmm. So I wear this so that I've got a little mobile go button. And so I have a little, you know, cue list in Ableton that I'm able to step through so that I can cue moments uh, just sort of based on, you, you know, where we are and where music is. Um, and then, yeah, all that's feeding into Touch Designer, which is, you know, loading different pieces of geometry and different render pipelines and... Um, and, and that kind of thing. And, and then all of that is fed to the Oculus. That's super cool. Made by Facebook, which is terrifying. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not great. But <laughs> the, <laughs> but that uh, that uh, that pipeline of information is really f fascinating. I love I love the idea that it's all built in Touch Designer that you don't have to have s something like Unity or Unreal as well controlling the whole thing. So, um, can, what what is that ring? Can you just what I've never seen that before. Can you talk yeah, about that? It, 
it, it's called a, 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 a wave, a Genki, G-E-N-K-I wave. And it, you can see that like it measures um, a pan and tilt. Oh. You can see the, the light sort of, it knows what's going on here. Mm -hmm. um, we don't use any of that, but it also has a little button that will send a MIDI message <laughs> and it connects by Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually is really effective and very mm -hmm. sensitive and very accurate. And I think it works all the time. In fact, the ring is not what broke. Um, it's, it seems to be Ableton that broke. Ableton stopped listening to and sending uh, certain channels of MIDI, right? Like moments before we joined your call. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then, and then I, I heard you, you, you did a full reset and it still didn't. Both machines huh. fully down, back up, all the software oh. rebooted yeah. and, uh, and no dice. So we're still in that position and that's where we'll start when we go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> back to work, fix it. Uh, great. Um, so another question that came in from, from the audience was um, how, how much of the VR was masking the set and how much was your lighting? Well, um, I mean, in, in, in the forest scene that we did live for you, uh, the VR is masking everything. Not one bit of the real world comes through that scene. And we'll, so that's like, that's sort of the, the, the show starts in this room, ostensibly, and sort of the elements sort of are, are built and it does kind of have a, a journey that is like more and more surreal and more and more of a liftoff. And, and so there, there are times when we are in this room and the VR is kind of like the way we started this presentation and in the video where you can see there, there's a VR, uh, there's a virtual object in, in this space that we can move around. And then, but we do go to those worlds and in that case, like the the connect camera has a really sort of um very it's got a lot of character but it it does background subtraction so the connect camera can just see a human and cut out everything around them um and it's also kind of the camera's pointed into kind of a black void into blacks and so that is just like a sort of pasted into a scene that is fully immersive for sylvia um as you saw on the screen I mean, Sylvia is not even really facing me and I'm not facing Sylvia that, and we're still able to sort of assemble it in those ways, but mm -hmm. um, so, we're, we're figuring out also about how to, yeah, what, what, <laughs> how much of the room will people see once we're, we're fully done here and when we're open next week, we're not sure at this point, we have almost everything blacked out though. And yeah. you can just see the lights up top. The, the keyboard mm -hmm. and, and Aaron behind the keyboard feels like, the fundamental set piece in the room and, and kind of the home base in many ways of the story. Yeah. Um, but it's only there some of the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah. That's um, so, so in terms of the, 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 op, the, the times when uh, you see Sylvia in the camera and then also in the world, there's a question actually is, are we, are we, do we see Sylvia well, in the well, 3d not world? Intentionally. It did not intentionally. Okay. Yeah, it did. I, I was trying to get out of that, which I don't know how that don't even came here. here. I've never seen that happen in that moment on that, yeah, on that carpet. Yeah. Just a little bit too far, but yes, that's yeah. not intentional. Yeah. So, so in, again, I guess kind of just coming back to this, Sylvia, do you see, do you see Aaron's connect feed into your camera as well when you're in that world? Exactly what you saw. Yeah. Is, is what, what is. is what's here. Okay. So, yeah. okay. That's really yeah. interesting. So um, I was able to see that I was catching myself trying to get out of it, but also being like, I don't actually know where I am in the room. I don't know <laughs> yeah. how I got here. And there was one point where I like had my leg out behind me trying to feel for my braille on the floor and someone went to move me and I was like, don't move me because then this is gonna be off. So it's like, I'm trying to know where I am so that I got a sense of where I am in the room, but I can't move because then Aaron will be off of center. Mm -hmm. And then chains will be going through him. And so it's like all of those things is the, I feel like the most focus that I'm in is that I have to be aware of my frame. Mm 
So not only am I trying to make eye contact with Aaron, which is hilarious because we have a lot of like this closeness yeah. um, where I feel very direct, but Aaron's looking into a machine. Yeah. So I feel that's probably why we have to embrace on the other end is because I've been looking so directly into Aaron's face for an yeah. hour and 20 minutes. But then there's other times where like that moment where we're separated from each other and it gives a, a very different feel, but that, that disconnect there today where I was like, I don't have any idea where I am. I can't move. I don't know how I got into the shot. Like there's a, you know, yeah. Yeah. That, that uncertainty of like, well, I, I just keep him centered and hope that I'm not going outside of this. I don't want to get lights in. I have to, you know, and mm -hmm. as you see the show next week, there's elements where it's important that I'm keeping my frame so that we're getting all of the elements. I have to keep Aaron in, I have to, and what's interesting is that my frame isn't exactly your frame. No, right. Your frame is bigger Lighter, than yeah. my frame. Mm -hmm. So knowing that though it looks like I've only got half of Aaron's face, you actually have his whole head and a little bit of his shoulder. Yeah. So trying to constantly be connecting with Aaron to know that the eye contact is correct, but that the frame is also carrying what it needs to carry. Mm -hmm. So my eyes are actually constantly going, but my body can't, That's if yeah. that makes any sense. The Oculus mm -hmm. in VR, first of all, like Sylvia witnesses this all in 3D, which is kind of fantastic. But then, you know, the, the Oculus moves into the periphery, whereas the periphery is actual pixels on our screen that we see completely. But the Oculus, you know, things that appear like right there, like I can see my finger but not really like i can't actually see my finger mm -hmm. i just can kind of feel it <laughs> but on the screen it's clearly right there and so that's mm -hmm. an interesting yeah conundrum and that's and that's really because the uh inside the inside the vr you've got the two tiny uh your tiny lenses that you can only see what's being seen here but the computer program is taking two screen resolutions and putting them together and then there's extra information yeah. that's there yeah so yeah that's uh <laughs> this, this is uh this has been really delightful to hear about <laughs> um uh yeah so you want to talk a little bit about the the sound setup so it's running through ableton what other what other pieces of equipment are you working with so uh, i'm wearing a lav a wireless lab and I just have a set of wireless in-ears and Sylvia is kind of set up with a set of headphones as well. Um, and uh, actually our whole team is on headphones. So mm -hmm. we're like, no one can hear the music. Like the sound in the room is feet and breathing. And um, <laughs> what's that? We could show it to you. <laughs> we could take you over there. Um, the, uh, yeah, the, maybe this is interesting to go look at. Uh, go on a journey. Love it. Welcome to Tesla. Uh, so first, it, these are all the inputs, which is a MIDI keyboard um, and, and some synthesizers that normally work all the time uh, going into a mixer. And so maybe a percentage of the music involves uh, live synthesizer mangling and, and manipulation. And there are numerous moments of piano playing in the show. And the piano kind of plays with important role in story. Mm -hmm. So this is home, home base for that. Uh, and then, yeah, this is, uh, this. maybe we go around the other side, Alex. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, here's connect land, connect. And uh, I have a monitor so I can see myself run below there. Okay. And then the other side is this is where the computers and Alex and Matt live, manage the stream and manage Touch Designer. So Touch Designer and Ableton run here on two different computers and a third computer runs the stream. We actually have five computers going during this show because we have uh, the Ableton computer, the Touch Designer computer, the stream computer. Uh, I'm developing modules on my laptop and you're doing it in work on and we're actually zooming to you on this one. We're zoom calling from right now. So plus phones <laughs> and other devices. So at any given moment, there's like there can be like five to eight screens. It doesn't cause any anxiety Perfect. at all. No, not at all. This <laughs> what could possibly go wrong <laughs> possibly go <laughs> when you have five computers running at the same time. I mean, it wouldn't be making a show, a digital theater show in this time if it wasn't all junk multiple screens and computers all cobbled together to 
yeah. the other. So. What I what I enjoy about it from my perspective is that once the show starts, I have no screens and I see none of this. Yes. Mm-hmm. All I see is is Sylvia's body and her her glass robot eyes, mm-hmm. and, and my my keyboards. And I have a good you know I have a good sound mix happening, um, and, and yeah, for me during performance this kind of melts away un- until it doesn't work properly. Yeah, and that's and that's that's a perfect place for you to be as a performer. It is, and we've we've actually talked about what it means to be in conversation with this equipment anyway. The, like the the acknowledgement of it in terms of being like, what happens if we go on a queue and it's way off center or it doesn't load the module, or what, you know what what do you do in in those cases? You know, shows that are usually this complex. Well, first of all, live shows that run this way are are pretty new. Um, mm-hmm. We're using technology that you know is really first generation in its its kind of you know c- usability uh, and reliability maybe, mm-hmm. um, and we don't have redundancy like we don't have a whole other rig of this running at the same time that we switch to if this doesn't run. Mm-hmm. So we've we've been talking about what it means to be sort of if if things go wrong to say. To, to stay with you and say, hmm, there's a there's a problem with the magic machine. And so we're gonna have our, our magic helpers back here uh, do some things. Why don't you have a look at this little glowing sphere? And uh, I'll walk you through what I'm about to do. I just need to go back here and reset the feedback parameter and try to load the module again. And uh, yeah, that's, mm-hmm. that's something we're figuring out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a it's it's a conversation that's come up a couple of times throughout the symposium. Is is how do you how do you really show liveness within a performance? How do you how do you know in this kind of digital right. context that we live within? And uh, oftentimes the answer is either interactivity from the audience or failure <laughs> on the point yeah. of the uh, of the performance. Right. So the, those how do you how do you take those moments and turn them into part of the show and continue going with it? That's all that ex- very exciting for us. I think anyway. part of our show kind of yeah does sort of center on the fact that I really I kind of built this sh- show for well for the audience, but also for for the person in the play that I'm with. Mm-hmm. And so I have the little a little permission slip to be like the show I built is it's still buggy. I'm yeah. just gonna go. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's very it's very personal on that on that level. And so so your interaction with the audience can be personal. Like this is a thing that I have made and I am presenting to you and Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah it's really, it's really beautiful. Not unlike today. <laughs> <laughs> and there you go. We know we're live. Everyone yeah. knows that we're actually <laughs> here. We're here talking in the moment. Um so yeah, this has been really great. I think uh, we, we've reached the time and now you all need to get back to work and make it ready Yeah. Till for Wednesday. <laughs> yes. Yeah, this ready. is a- Practice making more mistakes. Yeah. Thank you uh, for having us as part of this festival. Of it's truly incredible what uh, you're doing in terms of this huge uh, look into digital dramaturgy and design. It's incredible. It's huge too, like mm-hmm. massive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're 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 almost at the end of it. It's been four weeks. It's been very long, uh, but it's been really great. And thank you, thank you for saying that. Uh, thank you for coming out and being here, sharing with us. I know it's it's always very uh, nerve wracking when you're in the middle of a process, sharing your work and uh, sharing your potentiality for failure. So that's it's really. <laughs> <laughs> Great. We really appreciate well, you being able here. To practice failing with yeah. all of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, and, uh, and then the parts that worked worked really well, and I'm very excited to see uh, see it next week. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>